Hello and welcome to season two, episode 15 of Dualist Unity. I am playing the part of Andrew today. And I'm going to continue playing the part of Ray. Today we are joined by a very special guest who is playing the part of John Copeland, uh, who is John Copeland 6 on TikTok. For anybody who isn't following him, I definitely recommend that you do. Uh, John describes himself on his Instagram as a traveler on a pathless path, which I thought was absolutely perfect. He is a fan of non-duality and everything about this conversation, so we're excited to have him join us today. Uh, John, just for the benefit of our audience, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself how you came to this pathless path, and um, a little bit about your journey. Awesome. Well, thank you, Andrew and Ray, for having me on. Um, I know I got a little small TikTok account. The reason I actually started it partly was because of Andrew, honestly, like seeing him post all these things. And I was like, I really feel this way as well. And I should just be honest and start posting how I feel and kind of breaking down those barriers of self-consciousness that you sometimes find yourself uh, when you are posting on social media, right? Um, so it's kind of an honor to be here and I, I really respect you guys reaching out to me. That was awesome. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, all this, uh, spiritual stuff is, is fairly new to me as well. Um, I've really only been, uh, really involved in it for about a year and a half now. What really led me to this, um, specific stuff was a very challenging point in my life. Um, I had been an addict for about two years, two to three years. And when I worked, when COVID hit, um, started working remotely, that really made my usage go up a lot, right? I was a closet user. I was a successful dude. Uh, no one really knew what I was doing. So it was all just internal shaming. Externally, perfect life. Internally, suffering deeply and getting by with uh, substances, right? So COVID hits. I work remotely, my usage kind of goes crazy. Um, and then essentially there's like a house of cards moment where everything falls out. I was trying to act like this perfect person and all this stuff. And my girlfriend found out and uh, we actually lived together and she didn't know that I was using. Um, so at that moment where she found out was the first time in about two years of being a daily user that I had to talk to somebody about what I was doing with myself and like, what was my plan on going forward? And that really was such an inflection point in my life, to be honest. Um, after doing what I had done uh, for about two, two and a half years to having to talk to somebody about it was the heaviest thing I'd ever done. And it was that conversation that you're the most scared about. You think about it every day, like who's gonna find out, like what is this gonna happen? I mean, the biggest thing I was worried about was what people would say about me if they knew, right? That was like the scariest thing. It wasn't even what I was doing to myself. It was like, how would the world view me? Uh, which is another topic in its entirety. But uh, essentially, uh, yeah, so I had to own up to my girlfriend. And uh, in doing so, I was like, I knew this wasn't gonna, this isn't sustainable. I knew this couldn't go on forever. Um, so I had two options, really. At least I thought I had two options. And it was a uh, white knuckle it with AA like legitimate sobriety, going to meetings every week um, or go to a psychedelic treatment clinic in Mexico and see if that's like a magic pill. Um, and to me, it literally was a magic pill uh, to the extent that sounds fake, honestly. When I tell people this story, they don't really believe what it did for me. And I, to this day, I feel like I'm living a dream, to be honest. That was, that was about a year and a half ago. Um, when that happened and I haven't touched anything since then. So, and it's not even <laughs> part of me, like, I don't really take pride in it because it's just like part of life and things like that. Um, but essentially I was never spiritual, this whole thing just, so that happens. I quit my job. I go to a psychedelic treatment clinic in Mexico. I have the most profound experience in my life. Um, I truly reconciled dying like a near-death experience to my core. Um, and after that experience, the next day I woke up and this is like, when you start talking about the synchronicities of the world and all this shit, like when I was going to the clinic, I had a Genghis Khan book that I was reading a lot of history. So I had a Genghis Khan book and I'm about to leave. And I was like, you know what, John, you'll want one more book. I know you'll want one more book. Literally last second, I go into my room and I pick up this book, Buddhism for Busy People. Never had read Buddhism. I just brought it with me. Just something in my head right when I was leaving. I was like, grab this book, grab this book. 
And uh, so I go through the clinic, I go through that experience. Um, and so I did Ibogaine one night and then the next day I did the 5-MAO DMT. And then the next day I woke up and I literally felt like I had just reset everything in my body going from this daily addict to like this like freedom like what am i going to be john who are you going to be like who are you going to choose to be with this second chance of life and that's literally when i read just pick up this book i was drawn to it and the first fucking chapter is what does it take to be happy that's the first chapter and that literally that's the that's the question on the first chapter and that one question is the only question i really think about 24 seven these days. And now it's been a year and a half um, since that experience and reading that one chapter, I knew where I like, it, it was something that just resonated to my core. And I was like, I want to know what truly makes me happy. Not what I think makes me happy. Cause what I used to think made me happy, made me fucking, made, so, excuse me, swear, uh, made me miserable and sent me down a bad path. Uh, so this is the book that sent me on this journey of being obsessed with spirituality. And I used to hate, even when I was into it, I used to hate the word spirituality. Cause like my old self would like make fun of people that were like spiritual, like, Oh, fooey, all this type of stuff. Right. So for me, uh, this book really kicked it off. I started in Buddhism and it was just funny because, uh, that book specifically is Tibetan Buddhism slant. And I like got obsessed with Tibetan Buddhism. I was like, this is the path. This gotta be the path. And I just started reading all these intense books from Tibetan Buddhists. And then like I read one other book. I'm like, hey, this one is actually kind of interesting as well. Not necessarily as much baggage and dogma. And I start just flowing through like that and then Zen and then Hinduism. Like Ram Dass brought me to that. And then like this to Osho. I mean, everybody now, Rupert Spira, Henry Shukman, Adi Ashanti. I mean, all these dudes, these are like my idols these days. I used to idol. I used to like... Uh, respect and love rich people and all that stuff now i'm just so i just have so much reverence and respect for all these dudes that i do consider to be enlightened beings i know they wouldn't say that they're too humble themselves um but uh but yeah so that uh long story short that is kind of my story which uh led me onto the spiritual path and led me here today and i guess just a little more caveat of my story um maybe before we like go back and forth but so that experience happened I was unemployed for about six to seven months in San Diego, lived with my girlfriend and my best friend. And I'm just like trying to find like, this is like a full blown discovery. Like, John, you're 28 years old. You're on a full blown like self discovery. And I just started like, it was never like super intense, but it was just like this gravitational pull towards the stuff. Like starting to meditate, started to do yoga, started to read more stuff. Um, and then uh, I was unemployed for about six, seven months. And then about March, I'd say of 20, 21 was when I kind of noticed that I literally didn't have negative thoughts and that I literally felt like I had superpowers in a way where like I was truly convinced I was enlightened. And this kind of came out of nowhere. It wasn't like this earth shattering blowout oneness experience that people talk about, but it was one day and I was like, I literally do not suffer like anymore. And then like when you hear things like be here now, like I just, I was like, why don't people just be here now? It's so easy. Um, and that was something that lasted for about five, four or five months, like radical. Like it was radical for me. This is like this moment in itself, this like these few months, like shifted my brain forever. Like literally, and it's something that I'm like chasing to get back to. Now you shouldn't chase because you're never going to get there. All the time stuff, I get it. Um, but uh, I like was kind of convinced that like I was enlightened and I had insane confidence. Like it is it, it, an amount of confidence that I couldn't even describe. And it's funny because now I wonder, is that me just living out reality or is that me just like my ego kind of pushing this stuff in a certain way that's like gratifying me? I mean, I, these are the questions I have nowadays, but essentially uh, I would say I, I did have like an awakening experience that lasted for about four or five months. Like that was just pure bliss and love. And I was like convinced I was going to be like a spiritual teacher. I was going to be like Osho with like guiding all my minions to enlightenment. And then it kind of closed up a little bit. And then I started kind of like went away. Um, and there were a few weeks there that I was fairly depressed, to be honest, because I thought I lost this gem. When you like listen and read a spirituality, you're like, oh, I listen to people that were doing Zen for decades. And I'm like, what are they, what are they looking for? Like, it's right here. Like I didn't understand. And I had all this like co confidence and cocky attitude. Um, 
but uh, yeah, no, my conditionings came back. I had not uh, outrun my wheel of karma. So I got, I got work to do. Um, but uh, needless to say, I thought that experience was done, but that experience to me now is just a taste of what life can be like. And that's what is like motivating me and is the energy behind everything I do. Um, not necessarily to get back to that mindset, because I don't know if that's possible, but to get deeper into clarity and get deeper into understanding life and what truly brings me happiness. Because at those moments, I felt so aligned on every aspect of my life. It was just effortless, right? And I did feel like I was just living through my intuition and not through my mind, which now I still live through my mind and occasionally my intuition. But yeah, so that's... <laughs> That's kind of what happened. And then in the middle of that is when I started just like posting random things on TikTok. So I felt like I had all this, I was like, people don't realize like what I'm going through. And you, my friends and family aren't spiritual. So like I could say, I could yell as loud as I wanted to them about it, but they wouldn't know. So I was like, I, I got to just start saying some things, at least in a platform that some people might be able to understand. Uh, so that's why I kind of posted on TikTok here or there. And then like eventually you get, you post enough and then things go viral, you get excited and you post more and I was more consistent with it. But the, I mean, TikTok in itself is a weird uh, little dopamine system that gets you all jacked up at times and tears you down at others. And then you feel like your dopamine receptors are not working properly. So that's another conversation to be had. But uh, but yeah, man, I guess that's, what, that's what's led me here today on this podcast with you guys. And I love what you both do. Uh, I know Andrew's like uh, obviously got a big TikTok following. You've been kind of in this for a little bit. Ray seems like he's the uh, mentor, the master in this group right here that we could all we could all learn from. So uh, <laughs> I guess that's long story short. That maybe I I spoke too long there, but that uh, that's kind of my story and what led me to this podcast today. No, we uh, we appreciate all of that. That was fucking awesome to hear. Like that's exactly what we're hoping for. Give everyone <laughs> a, a background and and what's going on here with our guest. And I I learned a lot. You know, I've been following you for I don't know eight nine months now, and absolutely love your stuff. But I didn't know most of those things. It was really cool. And and that sort of journey of of the suffering leading you to recognizing and kind of getting you to like this breaking point of identity and having the choice of one thing or the other and then seeing that there isn't anywhere to get and then feeling that way and then and then feeling like you're losing a little bit and then and then clinging on to like this thing that you you want to get back to only ever you know realizing that it's always here now for you and then having like lulls and ups and downs since like I resonate with that so fucking much, dude. And yeah, by the way, like <laughs> swear, swear all you want on here. There, are, this is not a clean podcast, but um, yeah, wow, that was that was fucking awesome. And I, there's so many parts of it that I want to get into, but I guess one of them in particular that stood out was the experience that you had, like when you made the decision either go to AA or go have a treatment and go down to Mexico and, and do that. What was what was that like? Like, how did you hear about it? And then what was the experience like when you were going through it? And I would just love to hear more detail about that. Uh, it's, it's gnarly um, talking about this because when I do speak to people that are interested in to hear what I have to say and I go in and I tell them everything, it like brings out these feelings in me that like somewhat felt dormant, but uh, they come back because of how visceral uh, an experience it was to me. Um, but so the inflection point of owning, like figuring out what I'm going to do, right? This isn't sustainable. Like when I'm going to do AA, psychedelic treatment. Like to be honest, I always knew, even when I was an addict, that the out would be a psychedelic treatment clinic. And I knew that because I'm lazy and white knuckling sobriety sounded like it hell to me. And to be honest, I heard about it on Joe Rogan. So he talked about it. I began like years ago and he talked to that some guy on that was talking about how I began hell uh, cut heroin addiction. Uh, my addiction was opioids. So I always knew that that would be something that would help me. So I just never had the balls to check myself in, spend that money, check myself in, take time off. Um, it wasn't until that inflection point with my girlfriend where I decided to. And to be honest, I've always liked psychedelics. I, I, I mean, I was, um, I definitely used to treat them very recreationally. Uh, I now look at them as extremely therapeutic. And I think that the way that the majority of America looks at and the world looks at psychedelics is detrimental to their uh, ability to help people. Because the way that it helped me, like, to be honest, I feel like I should be an advocate 
for this clinic, like truly like an outspoken advocate. Um, but I still uh, not, this is the first time I've actually talked about it on a podcast fully, my story, like my TikTok, I haven't said it because I have a lot of family and friends that are on it. Um, but uh, I got to be honest, I got to be truthful, right? I mean, that's the, that's the crux of all this shit is like being, tr- living your truth, not hiding, like um, the shame wipes away when you're fine with it. And I'm fine with it because it made me the person I am today. And without it, like, I would never have changed a thing. And that's crazy to say, but truly, I, I, if, if I could go back in time, I would have still did what I did because it led me here today. Um, and I wouldn't trade that for the world because this is more than anything you could ever be given, like ever, like this type of stuff, like this type of understanding is deeper than any money, any relationships, anything in life, right? So it's like to your core. Um, so that's why I went to the psychedelic treatment clinic. I always kind of knew it was there. I was living in San Diego. So it was like right across the border at the time. Um, and it was four nights at a clinic at experience. I have which that place has a place in my heart, like <laughs> nothing else in the world because the work they're doing is saving lives and it's giving people truth and like getting people in touch with like who they really are. And it's making the world a better place. And I wish that stuff was legal in America. And I wish people, more people knew about it so they could have an out. Because there is an out. There's actually an ease. For me, it was an easy out. I think I was a very lucky person the way that happened. I'm a very extremely lucky person on every aspect of my life. Um, from friends, family, upbringing, my job situation. I've always been so lucky. Um, so I really feel like it worked out perfectly for me. But the experience in Mexico um, was four nights. Uh, the, it's, it's like bunch of nurses and doctors. This isn't a back alley thing. It was somewhat expensive. Um, so I had my own little apartment, like my own little suite overlooking the Mexico ocean. And uh, the first night uh, they give you Ibogaine, which starts at 9 p.m. at night. They give you four pills, one pill every hour. And that's about a 12 to 16 hour trip. Um, and it's extremely introspective, but slightly like different than other psychedelics because you're like, it's somewhat of a disassociative. So you feel like this deep introspection, but you feel somewhat removed from it. Um, where sometimes mushrooms, other things like you're in it, like you're fully in it. And the suffering, this is a little bit tweak. That was 12 to 16 hours. And then towards the end, um, you're just like very groggy and tired. It's like really weird. Like the whole time I'm hooked up to a heart monitor to check my heartbeat. So I'm just literally laying in a bed for 12 hours in Mexico with a, a heart, like a, like a thing on my heart, like test my heart and nurses coming every two hours and having these crazy visuals and visions and like the shadows of the wall are like turning into elephants. If I think of an elephant, I was like, oh my gosh, I can control this. Then I had these like crazy dystopian dreams, like in this future city civilization and all this stuff. Um, but then that was, so that was like really kind of weird. It was very much a dreamlike state. Um, but very introspective, of like looking in, looking in. Um, so that was like a day. And the next day, you're basically just tired the whole day. So you just sleep. And then the following day, I woke up. And then that's when I was like, sign me up. Let's do the toad, the 5-MEO DMT, which I had never done DMT before. I didn't really know what to expect. <laughs> the Ibogaine like, was crazy because I know that it resets your neurological pathways in your brain for like addictions and stuff like that. But the DMT, um, how do I, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I'm a little hesitant to fully describe it because it scares people away, like what it's like, but it redlines your anxiety and fear to a hundred thousand million X. And then when you can take it no longer, you accept that you're going to die. And in that inflection point of dying, you accept it. And you realize that you've never been that which you were just suffering. So that anxiety, that fear that I felt so deeply, when you let go and say, I'm fine with not this, I'm not, I'm fine with not being this anymore. You go, wow, I'm not that. Yeah, I'm not that. I'm not that. And then you wake up. And for me, I never sleep for everybody. Um, but for me, I woke up and I was pulsing euphoria, like out of every single aspect of my body. I started rolling around in the bed literally saying I've never felt uh, I've never felt this type of bliss before. I've never felt this type of bliss. And like the the nurse that was there with me, like said, calm down, like take a deep breath, take a deep breath. 
I take a deep breath. I feel like I'm literally like orgasming from every single part of my body. Like I didn't even know what was going on. And then it just like settles in. And then I just fucking cry my eyes out for about 10 minutes straight. Every single aspect of my life that I didn't like. Every negative thing I held about myself in society, I cried like I had never cried in my life. Um, Full blown, like every single inch of you that has this resistance. I cried and I bawled my eyes out. And after that feeling, I have never been the same person ever since then. And uh, I can't even believe shit like this exists. And I really, really can't believe like what it did for me. And I can't imagine what it does for everybody else. And uh, (laughs) it's, uh, I just, as I mentioned, I wish everyone knew about it, but for me, it just gave me such an appreciation for, for life. It gave me a second chance and it allowed me to build up, build myself up from like a new operating system. And what was the operating system that I chose? It was like Buddhism and spirituality. So now you can say, John, instead of chasing a high on drugs, I'm chasing a high on meditation, which I know isn't necessarily good, but it's a lot more productive. <laughs> um but uh but yeah that was the experience for me and it was just essentially it was a near-death experience so when you come back online it's like how how are you going to live john how are you going to be and uh, for me it was just the best reset to start my life again truly and live out my uh (laughs) just live out like what i really am as opposed to being deluded and thinking all these other stuff so yeah that was kind of that was kind of my experience in mexico i really appreciate you sharing that uh similar experience in my own life about 20 years ago but it wasn't it wasn't assisted by any means it, it definitely wasn't under the <laughs> watchful eye of, of anybody who gave a shit but um it was the end of the line it was this or death like that that was it right like there, there was just no more there was no more rock bottom to pound my head against it was this or, or nothing and, and then all of a sudden boom there's that door and that was exactly it it was it was like the door just appeared but it had always been there and i, I went through the same process of crying and laughing and crying and laughing. And I remember very much the next morning staring out the window, uh, which had been broken recently by crackheads who were targeting a neighbor. Um, and so it's cold, it's winter, and I'm staring out my, out my window and everybody else is like, you know, why would you be happy in this situation? I've just got this big grin on my face, right? And, and it's just because I knew my life would never be the same. Everything that my life was up until that point was suddenly optional. It wasn't me. It had never been me. It's just that I had never gotten that. And as soon as I got that, it was like, oh, that's the path. Shit. Like, that's the whole thing. And that's why I think it's interesting you got pulled towards Buddhism. For me, it was Taoism in a big way, right? Because it's the negation of the reliance on that self-image. It's the negation of taking that self-image seriously. It's, It's watching the balance as opposed to picking a side, right? And so it's interesting because you'd say, like, that's the new operating system. But even that's kind of like operating on top of the machine code, which is just that knowledge that you're not what you think you are, right? It's, it's that state of being. And so even as we oscillate back and forth, and we talked about this previously, there's always that, that sense of, of direction now that you don't lose. Like even when you get lost in stuff, you still know, like, I'm getting lost in stuff. You know it, right? As opposed to getting caught in it and forgetting it. And, and I find that to be one of the most important things that I learned from that experience was just the recognition that there was something to get caught up in, that there was an illusion to see, right? Because up until that point, I didn't realize that I was reacting to it all the time. So I really appreciate you sharing this story. And I know with our audience in, in particular, it's going to resonate with a lot of people, psychedelics or not, because, and this is something I wanted to add that it wasn't just the psychedelics, nor, nor the clinic that you went to so much as your willingness to change your willingness to face at that point in your life because the two had to converge because I I had done psychedelics many times and and just you know sat and giggled at the nature of string like it didn't do anything profound because I wasn't ready for it to I was avoiding it right so I I find that to be an incredible story thank you John I really appreciate it my pleasure it's uh I get so much enjoyment talking about it because I know that it can be a message that someone else could hear and know is true, right? Because I'm speaking from like the depths of my being. Um, this isn't a story just to be a story. This is like my lived experience that radically shifted my life. Um, but uh, yeah, to, to your extent, like 
the North star. Like for me, it's like a North star, right? No matter what I'm in, no matter how much I'm suffering or um, upset about this or that, or maybe drink, like drinking more than I should. Like, it's not like I'm completely sober. I don't do opioids anymore, but I still drink and stuff like that. But I, I know, I know that like, no matter what I go to or go through, like the, the, the North star is like silence and peace and stillness. It's not covering it up. So I got to, that having that North star makes my life easier, makes my life so much easier. In the extent I can't even describe to people, you say this to people, they like, Oh, still this peace. But when you truly like feel it and live it, it's like, that is it. Like I can go down these paths. I can get delusional here or there. Um, but that's my North star. And that's, when that's always like when you're just chasing, like when you're just chasing silence and peace, and that is really the goal, you always have the ability to get there. Whereas with like drugs and status or money or power, like it's it's a constant chase, but the stillness and the peace is always there. Um, and for me nowadays, I like I'm up to, like I never used to be a big hiker or nature guy, but now I just like my girlfriend's like, why are you staring at the tree for ten minutes? I'm like, <laughs> why would I not be? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. It's it's just like seeing seeing the option here and now is it like seeing the option that you have a choice in how to respond and how to react in in any situation. And I like what you said before when you were going through your story, talking about how you know it used to be chasing money or all these external things. And, and it isn't that anymore. And the things that are most valuable are not the things that cost anything. And for me, one of my favorite things is since having experiences and, and Ray and, and Johnny both shared your experiences and I've shared mine plenty of times on the podcast, my sort of awakening last summer where it was just recognizing that I'm not my past and, and I don't have a past really. And I'm just aware here and now that is it. And ever since it's, it was like, after that, it was a week of like complete bliss. I felt like I was high, higher than I've been on mushrooms besides maybe like four or five grams, but like similar to like two to three gram mushroom trip. That's how I felt for a week. And I had never done any psychedelics before, but since that, since that day, one of my favorite things to do is to figure out ways to communicate these insights like that is that's my peak it's not like you know going on vacation it's not like making a bunch of money it's like being able to figure out ways to communicate and using my whatever abilities that i have that i've learned over time of like telling stories or using analogies or whatever to communicate this level of freedom because it is truly unmatched and it's not something you can buy it's not something you can own, but it's something that's always available. And, and that's the, the, one of the biggest beauties of it is, is the simple recognition that it's always aw- available. It's that one step process of awareness that is always available here and now, and anything you ever try to get back to, or try to achieve is already what you are right now. And f- just figuring out ways to, to communicate that is one of my favorite things to do. And, and it has nothing to do with any amount of money or any recognition. It's just, I, there's such a strong sense of freedom with that recognition and, and peace. And just, it, it is like superpower. It's like nothing is holding you back anymore from being what you truly are. And, and so why wouldn't I want to share that with all of the other incarnations of me, right? It, it's, it's like one of the greatest things ever. One of my favorite things to do, admittedly, it's one of the, well, it's the reason that we've invited John on because John, your content speaks genuinely. There's an authenticity to your content because it's coming from a place uh, of your experience. It's not philosophy. It's not just stuff you've read in a book. I mean, there was, there is some elements of that. You are, you know, a learned person for sure. But on the other hand, it's coming from yourself. It's coming from your own experience from your own existence and, and that always comes across when you're speaking uh, you did a video fairly recently actually I don't remember exactly when but it was some re- self-reflection on on that period where you were like yeah I, I was an enlightened master for a while I was just grooving <laughs> to it and then 
it all came crashing down. And, and what I, I loved about that is that that is not something that you will typically hear you, your enlightened guru talk about, though they will experience that. And, and that's the problem with the, guru, the gurus who often are in the public is that they're selling a product, right? And because they're selling a product, they have to buff that product. They've got to you know, make sure it looks good. And they don't want to tell you like, yeah, every once in a while, I feel like a real shit heel. Or every once in a while, I feel like an imposter. They don't want to say that. But those are the experiences that inform the insights that they're sharing. So even sharing those experiences have value, but we don't get to see that. You know, like with Krishnamurti, for example, you can listen to Krishnamurti all day long, but when you go and look at his life, you see a different person. There's more to him. There's more nuance. Alan Watts, same thing. You can listen to Alan Watts, but then when you learn about his life and his decisions and the things that he did, there become, there's more uh, richness to it because it wasn't just an enlightened being, but rather another person, a schmo, you know, Joe Schmo, just going through the dirt, trying to figure stuff out who found his stride. Right. And, and that's, that's the reason I really enjoy your content is because of that is that I can see that you see the path. I can see that you see it very clearly, but you're still juggling with that idea of, is there a me on this path, right? And what does that mean? And, and, and that's fun, enjoy that part while you can, right? Because eventually that distortion fades entirely. Like, and, and it almost gets fun to find that distortion. Like I was saying to somebody uh, last week, I enjoy it when I, I find a trigger point, something that sets me off, I'm like, oh, there's something I missed. And it gives me something to dig into and look at and, and really, you know, flesh out the distortion, but it's less and less to the point where it's just ease. But I wanted to comment quickly on, on the high that you felt and then the, the crash back down because that that's common. That happens a lot, especially when you, you reach freedom and you're like, yeah, this is it. And it feels so good. Why, why Ray? It's, it's stupid. Why does it go away? Why we get used to it. Stay? <laughs> we get used to it right and so we start to take it for granted yeah. we start falling back yeah. into time it stops being as fresh right because that state of being in the moment being fresh of, of being uncertain all the time it's like you know riding a tightrope right you can't yeah. ever get comfortable because as soon as you're comfortable you're starting to stagnate this is why andrew and i used to joke in season one that I, as soon as i'm comfortable i get uncomfortable No, definitely. Um, I completely really, I get comfortable. I mean, I, I like traveling a lot to like get to new places and because it just forces a new perspective. And this whole thing's about a new perspective or um, no perspective. So try to tear away your perspective and view life as it is. But to your point about like, uh, there's a bunch in like the spiritual world about like light and love and just love and be light. And like, I agree with that. Like, I kind of feel like I am that fundamentally, <laughs> but um to me, there's a lot of people like that do kind of grandstand or like, because to me, I feel like enlightenment does have this uh, permanent, like it's like this destination that people think. And I think the term itself has been way overloaded. That's why like modern day masters that I listen to, I feel like they, uh, they don't say the world enough light and right because it has all these connotations and things like that. But uh, for me in particular, like being honest about what I'm going through is like a form of therapy for me. So like... <laughs> Like I just stopped, kind of stopped posting on TikTok for about two months there. And then I was like, you know what? I want to get back into it. And I was like, John, just be honest. Like that's what's helped you. That's what's got you here. That's what got people to follow you is being honest. So I, it's funny. I'd be honest and I see the reactions and it gives me this like newfound energy to like continue posting and going with it. Right. Um, so for me, it's just about this stuff is just about being completely self-aware and being completely truthful. Right. And not trying to hide behind anything. Cause the minute you start thinking you're something, um like definitive is when you lose you lose it right so it's a constant process of opening understanding the conditioning opening like conditioning comes back and just like a slow process that's at least is what it's been a little bit for me um but uh, but yeah i mean at the end of the day is it happiness is it peace i mean for me what i had a super happiness i had so much peace but the freedom is a different like i felt a level of freedom that's beyond description during that period and it was like i could do whatever i want whenever i want and i was fine with it it didn't matter what anyone thought and nowadays i definitely the conditionings are back i definitely think like oh am i gonna sit cross legged into here am i gonna do this and all this type of stuff but the freedom is what people should chase because that's essentially what i think the ultimate is is, is just complete freedom and then through the freedom is when peace and, and happiness come through 
but the freedom is like nothing that other like it, it exists like anyone listen to this like it really exists within you like if you pay attention like i was just fortunate enough for my life events to line up and go to a psychedelic treatment clinic but this is possible for everybody and it's something that i just want them to know that like um their ideas of self and what they suffer and their expectations of themselves aren't necessary you just take a second quiet your mind and just be in the moment um so the freedom is the freedom is what i love i mean um even before like i said like the like the kind of like the march of last year the uh like the full-blown awakening like during those six months of being unemployed um there were like random moments that were just like it's funny back then i didn't really understand it but now i look back on it and i'm like this moment was like it was like guiding me like i remember just one time i got out of the shower and i was just like drying myself off and like i literally heard like rob Dawes say like you're home john and I just started bawling my eyes out. I'm just like sober, like in my room, I'm just like drying myself off. But I have this like attention to like go through my body, like to my soul. And I was like, you're home. Like, this is your home. This is where you've always been. And it was just uh, like these experiences exist and they're real. Um, and it's just like, uh, that was like one. The other was like, I remember just going to the bathroom, just taking a pee. And it was like, it was just like this little voice that was like, you don't have to do anything, John, besides be here. And I'm like peeing, having this like somewhat oneness experience. Like, what is that? Like, what is happening right now? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's crazy stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah. And the beauty is that it's always available. It's, and it's only ever available here and now is, is the yeah. key. There is, there is nowhere to get that isn't, here all the time and, and in that recognition i think is is the freedom and there's just yeah it's it's like we get caught up in remembering certain experiences and, and thinking back to a time in our life where we felt more free and that moment is no different than this moment just that our ideas get caught up in thinking that it isn't this moment. It's another moment, but it's the same moment, the same here and now. And I liked what you were saying before about the authenticity aspect of it, because there's such an ease and lightness and freedom in authenticity. And I posted a video. Uh, I was at the mall yesterday with, with my mom and sister. I had, no, I had no reason to go besides that I had a video idea that I wanted to film. And they were like, we're going to the mall. And I was like, yeah, I don't have any stores I want to go to, but I'm just going to like, well, you guys go. I'm just going to walk around. So I walked around and then someone commented on, I was talking about how just like judgment, everyone's the reason for judgment and people do it to feel better. And it's double-edged sword because as you rely on other people or as you rely on your own judgments to be the truth, you see that other people's judgments are also will be taken as the truth by you. And, and so there's no reason. And, and most of the people aren't going to be judging anyway, but someone commented on a video, do some, do some weird dance in, in the mall. So I, I just like prop my phone up. It was on the way out. I was going back and forth, like, Oh fuck. Like, do I want to do this? I'm going to be so uncomfortable doing this. And finally it's like, as right as my, my mom and sister had already walked out of the mall and I'm like, fuck it. I put it up, did some like funny dance and then left. And someone, some people commented, like a lot of people enjoyed it, but some people were like, why'd your face get red? Like, I thought you didn't care what people thought. And it was funny. Cause it was like, well, you see, that's, that's not the key. Isn't to, to never get nervous. The key isn't to never have a red face or feel embarrassed. The key is that no matter how afraid you are, no matter how nervous you are, it's just that the fear doesn't get in your way. And being open about being afraid, I think, so I think when it comes to like enlightened gurus or any like famous person who talks about stuff like this and, and public speaking and being confident, they, they overlook the side of it that's like, it's okay to be nervous. It's okay to be afraid. It's not about getting rid of the nerves or getting rid of the fear or any emotion that you ever experience. It's just about through the acceptance of those things and through the ability to, despite whatever you're feeling, make a choice in the moment to not let that stop you. Like that, that is where the freedom comes from. It's not something before that where it's like, oh, I've gotten to a point where I never feel any negative emotion. It's like, I feel negative emotions all the time. It's just 
my perception of them and my perspective about them. I just don't let them stop me from doing things anymore. Whereas before I used to think when I used to get so nervous about stuff back even five years ago, I would get incredibly nervous about things. And I thought I had this idea that I had to you know, get rid of the nerves and, and that was never it. I always thought like, oh, you know, people who are really good public speaking, they, they must never get nervous. And it's not like that. It's like, I, I can, you can be nervous. You can feel all the feelings that you always have and do it anyway and do a very good job anyway. So when it comes to the authenticity and like the ease and freedom of that, it's like, there's so much freedom because it doesn't matter how you're feeling in any moment. It's like every single moment you feel a certain way and the acceptance of that and the ability to persevere no matter what, it's like all of a sudden it doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter the emotion that you're going through or the thing that you're suffering through. You're able to see because you have this clarity and, and you can see the options to make the decision despite whatever you're going through, or you see the option to, you know, you don't have to continue suffering through this and clinging to the identity that you always have, thinking that you are this type of person. You can see, you can almost like create that little bit of separation and see that, you know, you're never, you've never been what you thought you were. So you're not this person that you think you are. And you have the opportunity to be whatever you could possibly imagine in this moment, all of the options are available to you here and now, but whatever you're feeling is perfectly fine as well. And being open about that builds that connection with people that I think a lot of people miss out on or try and suppress because they think people have this idea of them that they're trying to live up to because they have this idea of themselves. And it's like this kind of weird, vicious cycle where they, they're never actually authentic. They just do what they think other people want them to be. So then they're not free. They're kind of stuck in that prison of what they think they are and what other people think they are and what they think other people think they are. <laughs> but there's, yeah. So a lot of freedom in that authenticity of recognizing that you never have to be anything besides what you are here and now. I actually find it really funny that when we talk about freedom, freedom as a concept, isn't actually freedom. As long as you have freedom as a concept, you're not free, right? Because there's a path. So you're within the confines of that path. So the path itself is tied to the identity. Without I, without I, there is no path, right? It's just where you are because the reality is there is no path. And, and that's the thing that I keep running across is, is just the recognition. It's not about getting to anywhere. It's about recognizing that wherever I am is not the truth. It's not the whole, it's just the perception I'm in. It's not even the perception I'm in so much as the perception I am, right? This was something that Krishnamurti said, and, and I, I really resonated with it when I, when I read it, was that it's not that you're experiencing anger, you are embodying the reality of anger. You are anger incarnated. You are the, sim the symbolism of anger itself when you're angry. And freedom is being able to be that symbolism and change without having to go through a process or through an evolution to go from like anger to happy. They're both here now. They're both on the step you're on because there is no path. But as long as there's an I, then there has to be a path. There has to be many steps to get from the I that's angry to the I that's not, right? And so it's in letting go of the I, of the path, of certainty, of, of any concept whatsoever that we find ourselves in freedom again. But then there's the, pra the practice of balancing that while still dealing with the world, right? Because while we can do that, and it's very easy to do, other people have problems relating to it. And it's because they're not used to encountering freedom. What they're used to encountering are other prison cells. And then they compare themselves to those prison cells. Like this is what's in my prison cell. That's what they in their prison cell, mine is better. Then they run across somebody who doesn't have anything, but there's no walls. So there's nothing to compare. It's like, there's not even an argument. It's like, you're in prison. I have nothing to compete with. I'm free. And that's the reality of not having a path, right? But then there's the path to realizing that there is no path. Yay for paradoxes. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, right? It's all just so paradoxical. And <clears throat> uh, when I first started reading all this stuff, I remember getting a Zen book early on, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by Shenry Suzuki. I remember like reading it and being like, this is like, I, I don't understand any of this. 
but it's funny like the deeper you like the more you get into this stuff the like like at first you understand one percent and then like you understand two percent and then three percent i'd probably say i'm at four percent right now understanding zen <laughs> but uh but yeah no it is it's just because it's all paradoxical right so it's not your rational mind and that's like the biggest thing for me that is very freeing is that i don't need to have all the answers and actually having the answers is a detriment to being okay right so it's embracing the unknown or it's being okay with the unknown um to me unknown god universal consciousness it all is the same but so much of our westernized world is very intellectual right scientific wanting to splice everything externally and label it and categorize it but at the crux of what we are is unexplainable it's impossible to grasp right so it's like the surrendering to it which is just the path like in my eyes spirituality is essentially just a constant surrendering the surrendering the surrendering the surrendering to life as it is constantly um so even when i do feel my conditioning my patterns suffering it's can i accept this and the answer is yes but so many people want to say be here now right and you try to impose presence on the current moment like so i mean it's like spirituality it's like be here now be present be mindful i used to say that but when i was like awake i felt like i was like it i would tell people that like just be here now and they're like well it's not easy john but now the question that i say to myself honestly in these scenarios where i i don't feel 100 at peace or there is some resistance is, can i accept this and i just ask myself that and that question like open it's crazy out of your shot i was like random things click at certain times right so it's like listen to an adi ashanti clip and that's He's like, you don't need to impose presence. You just ask yourself, can you accept this? And the answer is yes, I can accept it, right? So that's what, um, that's one little trick that I use to kind of get through this stuff. Yeah. And, and it's like, even when you're resisting, can you accept your resistance? Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and to, when you're starting to resist your resistance, can you accept your resisting of your resistance? And it's always just, it's, it's never that, that it has to be this immediate thing, but as you do it more, you know, it, it gets easier. It, it's just whenever it happens, it happens. And it's like, and that's it. But a lot of people get so caught up in, in, you know, they start hearing about this stuff, getting into this stuff. And, and they think they, they build up this other idea of themselves as someone who, who gets it, you know? And, and I remember, earlier on, you know, last year, year and a half ago, when I first started building a following, I started to get caught up in this idea that I was someone who understood this stuff and someone who talked about like, you know, why it doesn't matter what anyone thinks of you, blah, blah, blah. And then, so I'd go into situations where I'd be like, oh shit, people probably have this idea of me and they, and they think I'm going to be this like uh, if I get nervous, I'm like, that doesn't, that's not what I am. And, and I, I can never get nervous because I talk about this stuff. And like, I, I'm someone who get it, gets it. And it's like, I, I built up this new idea of myself, which was just another idea of myself, no differently than that, the that, idea of myself. That's why it was, that's why it was so hard for me after it kind of went away is because I really did build this spiritual ego. Like I get it. Like, I understand it. I would walk around and be like, no one gets it. I get it. They don't get it. And like, it's funny because that, I know that for a reason, me having that like ego is why it's stuff I suffered more when, it, when the conditioning came back. Because it was like, I thought I was special. I thought I, like, I thought I had this like a, a special understanding, like I'm better than, but like, you know, you're not better than anyone. Everyone's the same. That's like the crux of spirituality. Um, but uh, no doubt for that spiritual ego that came back and bit me. So it is a humbling experience that was needed. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, it's moment to moment too. And, and it's like, it comes down to the question. If, if you see that you are someone who gets it and other people are people who don't get it, you see other people. And so do you really get it if you're still seeing exactly. other people? And I think a lot of people in spirituality get caught up on that step on thinking, even someone who, you know, has this radical, radical non-dual message. Maybe they see themselves as nothing, everythinging, but then they see other people not as nothing, everythinging. So could you be nothing, everythinging if there are other people who are something within nothing? And it brings about the question, like, if you see other people at all, do you really get it? 
if you, if you take that as the truth, obviously there's the perception and we have our individual perceptions, this conversation is being had. And therefore there are, you know, multiple perspectives being on display in whatever way you want to say that, but it's not the truth. It's not the, the deeper truth of this is that I'm just talking to myself and that's kind of it, but there is still the perception of others. So it's like, if you get caught up in thinking that, you're something special and, and other people aren't, are you that special? Cause you clearly don't fully get it. <laughs> well, and it starts creating a different relationship with reality. Um, John, I don't know if you've ever run across any of my old videos from 2005. I had hair. I had a lot of hair, um, but I was, I've seen a few of those on TikTok. I right. Have so TikTok, that, yeah. so I was about three or four years along at, at that point. And I was, I was wrestling with the spiritual ego. For, for that reason, because it was all very clear. And I, I very much had an attitude of how are you not getting this, right? Like if I can just explain it right, everything's gonna change. Everybody's gonna, you know, hold hands and sing Kumbaya and Utopia is like two steps away. And, and, and I was fully committed to that. And then of course that created frustration and that created conflict and that created uh, dissonance in conversations with other people. And so, and it was all very much because in that state of freedom, you start to reach back to your old programming, as you said, and your old programming thinks it needs control. It thinks responsibility and control go hand in hand, that because you are everything, you should control everything according to your preferences. And as soon as your preferences are involved, you're no longer yourself. Now you're right, you're right, your idea of yourself. And so I had to walk away. I had to leave talking to people in general because I had to reconcile, who am I trying to tell? Who am I trying to convince if it's me, right? And more importantly, why am I not okay with the person who is still being doubtful? Why am I not okay with the person who's judging me? Why am I not okay with all of these pieces? They're fine. There's nowhere to go. There's no place to achieve in terms of consciousness or enlightenment. Everything is what it is. Everything's perfect already. Why am I still having issues with this? And it's because there was still an I, right? And so that became the path there was to walk away and recognize where I was involved, where I was in the way in everything. And it came down to you know, being impatient at the grocery store. Like, I don't know what's supposed to happen, right? I don't know how fast I'm supposed to get to the next location or what I'm supposed to be doing. Like there's no separation. So I need to remove the, the division that I perceive from the story, which is humility, which is faith, which is just getting out of the way. It's all of that stuff. And so you end up getting closer and closer to a state of, of just fluidity. It's not even about spirituality. It's not about an enlightenment. It's about just being what is and allowing that to flow as you. So the separation between what you're doing, what you think you're doing, right? It disappears. Like you were talking earlier about uh, crossing your legs and then thinking like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this because somebody might be judging me for crossing my legs. And what I find funny about that is that there's two different things happening, right? On the one hand, there's the actual process of you going, I want to cross my leg and it happens. And then there's all the thought that happens on top of that. And then you actually go, well, maybe I should put my leg down. No, I don't want to put my leg down. My leg is comfortable. And then it's leg starts to get uncomfortable. And you're like, no, if I put my leg down, is that a sign that I'm giving in to what people think of me? <laughs> right? And you go through this whole process. And the fact is, is that your body is just going, oh, I'm going to put my leg up. No, that's not comfortable. And it puts it down. And we get in the, involved and we distort it. We put this narrative involving other people and ourselves and this whole thing. Regardless of all of that, the same thing is going to happen. It's the experience that we're having internally that's different. But what is still is, we are still part of the flow. We are still not separate. So we're just narrating for our own benefit, even though it's causing us just a huge amount of consequence and, and no small amount of frustration. I always find that really funny, but yeah, it really just came down to recognizing there's nowhere to go. Everything's fine. And so much energy is wasted, right? Like the amount of mental energy wasted in that one stupid little incident is just like, I'm like, the one thing that, like, I mean, obviously this stuff is great. I love it. It's changed my life. But you are, like, I'm now hyper aware of, like, the smallest resistance in me, right? And I knew that, like, I know that these things that, like, I feel now I wouldn't even have registered before all this stuff. But now I'm, like, hyper aware of these, like, little resistance patterns, which makes me, like, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's great because it's the, the overall sufferings are a lot less. But now I'm just, like, so acutely aware of these little things. And then it's like, oh, but sometimes I'm harder on myself than I should be about it when I know that it's obviously like full acceptance and things like that. Um, question to you, Ray, do you have like a sense of self? 
Of course. Absolutely. It's like the I'm, basis of my like, experience. Like when you, like, I know, like, when I hear like Rupert Spire or all these dudes talk, they say that, like, what they look at essentially in front of them, like the desk, is as intimate to them as their body. Like, is that your lived experience? Yes. Yes. My, my reality is me. There is no separation there. So absolutely. Which is what makes it interesting dealing with people because there's a lot of empathy there, right? Because I see myself in them, even if they don't see themselves within themselves or, or even within me, right? So it changes the experience. But again, they're me. And I know, I know very, very clearly that there are numerous different uh, states of mind I could be in where I don't recognize anything. And, and that's okay too, because that's part of the process. That's part of the step. Like if you look at our growth, collectively, um, we are making leaps and bounds forward. But if you look at it individually as one person, it looks like we're, we're stagnating. It looks like one person who goes through a life of suffering serves no purpose. But that person who went through a life of suffering inspired hundreds of other people to change their paths, to do something else, or maybe to go in, down a life of suffering themselves, which change more paths. And so there's so many intertwining stories, but they're all the same what is. It's all the same thing. And, and it's all just constantly reflecting unity that's the funny part about this is like as divisive as it may seem the fact is is that nothing's divided nothing is is dualistic it's all unity all of it all the time it's just that we get in the middle and so it's just maintaining recognition that the experience of division is not the reality of division right you can experience division that doesn't mean it's, you're divided right that's the beautiful part about experience it's meant to be divided and actually, I wanted to cover this quickly because somebody in Discord was asking, is it possible to achieve a state of non-duality, of just unity? And I would say that we're always in that state, but we're doing stuff on top, that we're distracted from that state. And we call that distraction identity. We call that distraction narrative, other people, you know, the, the perspective of duality, the illusion. It's just our commitment to it as truth that, that distorts us because the path isn't letting go of duality, it's recognizing that it's not real, that it's not the truth, it's not what is, it's only one side or the other, right? And as soon as you recognize that, that deeply enough, there is no more I to really dwell on, but there's the experience of I to embody, which is a different thing. And this is going back to the, the conversation that Andrew was referring to earlier. We were talking to somebody who was saying that there was no sense of me. And I'll call bullshit, because there has to be. There has to be a sense of me. It doesn't mean there has to be an idea of me, but the very function of your experience is the sense of me, the division between the observer and the observed, right? That's the experience. Without that sense of me, there's no experience, which is why meditation is so much fun. So meditation is complete surrendering of division, of duality, of experience as a whole. It's achieving unity. It's feeling unity. It, it doesn't lie within the same dualistic, uh, dualistic spectrum, right? Death, same thing, right? But here, on this plane, experiencing things, duality is a good thing until we take it seriously and we think it's true. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, that, that whole idea, we talked about it uh, maybe like six or seven episodes ago, but like that duality is unity. Like there isn't, it's not like these two separate things where it's like, you know, it used to be closer to unity and now it's like further from unity. It's like, it's always been unity and we're just perceiving it dualistically we're perceiving the division but division is only ever perception it's only ever conceptual and so it i've been thinking about this a little bit because I, I was actually watching a alan watts speech recently and he was talking about how division is completely conceptual and there are no separate events and there are no separate things it's all just right now eternally and we perceive division based on where we conceptually end things and start things. Like an example he used was the sun. We say it's, it's X so far away, but that's just visually, but we feel the sun. So we are only perceiving the division of the end of the, the physical sight, the, the light of the sun, but then we feel the sun. So does the sun end at where we see it end with our eyes or does it end where we feel it end at our skin. And so when it comes back to our idea of ourselves, that is only conceptual as well. And so 
if you think about the impacts, the ripples we all make, if I, you know, if any of us make a video and it changes someone's perspective, do we end at our skin or do we end at the impact that we have on the world? Like, is, is the, is, am I ending where my impact ends? Am I ending where the furthest person can hear my voice? Am I ending at the furthest thing that I can hear? Am I ending at the first thing that I can see? We typically just settle on, oh, I end at my skin. Uh, this is, you know, the idea of myself is my skin and my past. It's things I've done, you know, what school I went to, what I'm good and bad at, all these things I've experienced. But those are all concepts as well. And we could choose any concept to end this on. You could choose I end where my impact ends. I end where my ripples end. And the funny thing is that the ripples are always being made. And the ripples that we make on those maybe closer to us are being made on those then are being exponentially rippled out throughout all of existence. So it's like, when you think about it like that, in the, in the idea that division is only conceptual, it's like, where, where do you end? And that's when things start to get a little bit trippy when you start to realize that, you know, the, the physical sight of things may not be where you end. If you think about all the other senses, you know, what's the furthest thing you can smell? Is that where you end? It's, it's all conceptual. And it's so fascinating that all of the division that we experience is conceptual, no matter how we want to splice it up. Yeah, division, difference is not division, as we've said previously, right? And we tend to take it that way, that because there is a difference, that means that there, there's a division there, right? Because the ocean looks different than the land, they are not the same thing, but it's, it's the same thing expressed differently, right? Each and every person, each and every living thing is the same thing expressed differently. It's reality. What is expressed differently? And this is something that Andrew and I circle around a lot on this show is that when you remove your idea of yourself, when you really break it down to just awareness, the phenomenon of awareness that, that you are, you are the awareness of reality, which is the awareness that I am and the awareness of everybody else. We just superimpose our thought about ourselves on top of that, but we're all the same awareness. We're all the same eye with infinite eyeballs experiencing infinite different perspectives, right? From the same state of being, but we, we alternate the experience of that state of being according to the illusions that we commit to or, or the illusions that we're caught within, right? All of which are, are based on identity and the perspective of division, which is a biological thing. We have to learn the perspective of division just to be able to experience this, but we have this capacity to look beyond our physical experience. We have this capacity to look beyond our pain and our suffering and all of the things that are, are part of the narrative to experience freedom. And the freedom that we're experiencing is the state that always is. It was the blank slate we started from, right? It's the state that's always going to be and every living thing will always express forever. So we're all the same eternally living being. See, I know that and like I'm deep into this stuff, but like I don't feel like my like my day-to-day -day lived experience is like the desk is as intimate to me as my body. Like I I just like I'm not gonna lie and say that is my lived experience. So I do feel like there's like a lot more embodying to do with this type of um type of work, you know. But uh um I mean I could ask you guys questions all, all day. I don't I don't know how long you guys wanna how long we're gonna be doing this for. <laughs> we're good for a while. I, I did want to say one thing actually in regards to so there's something that's interesting about what you were saying in regards to the desk being as intimate to me as my body. Yes and no, right? Because there's a trade-off there because the desk isn't going to feel pain. So I have to be willing to accept that this desk is eventually going to fall apart and, and decay and, and go into the ground, in which case now I have to accept that about my body as well. Right. And so my connection to my body has changed. My perception of my body being as intimate or as important as it was has changed as well. Right. So death doesn't even become a concern anymore because it, it, it comes back to the same thought. Like, what's the worst that could happen? I die. And that's about the worst that could possibly happen. And then it's just you're continuing on anyway, because you as a person can never really die you as an awareness can never really die, but it changes your relationship to everything. On the one hand, it makes empathy so much more important because you can resonate with pretty much everything. On the other hand, it also gives you almost um, a more, not callous, 
but clinical look at, at reality as a whole, like you look at the nature of a forest fire and you recognize its importance instead of just mourning the loss of that forest. Right. So there is there is a different relationship to reality as a whole when you when you recognize unity. It, it, it's you care, but you also recognize that everything has its, its flow. Everything is temporary in, in that it's always changing into something else. And so there very much is this razor thin line between the joy of every moment being a new chance to create and the loss of every moment never happening again. Right. And you're always in yeah. the both. You're always in them both. And the trick is to walk between them or to be them both without settling on one. Because as soon as you do, you're back to the eye, right? And that's where the, flu yeah. and the fluidity starts to stagnate. See, that, that one, the way you said about the death thing, like my experience in Mexico really did like kind of shoo away my fear of death. Like truly, like don't get me wrong. If like a car comes near me, I'm gonna flinch. Like obviously, I like, guess I'm not like I'm still gonna want to preserve my body. But like the when people like really question like what's the afterlife or like what happens that like really I'm like why I'm like you just like for me it's like we just return to universal consciousness, right? Which is our home, which is what we're like yearning for. So it's not like there's a hell or heaven necessarily. It's like we're going to just our source, which is like universal consciousness. Um, in terms of like obviously awakening uh kind of matures specific aspects of yourself I, I felt that within myself but i do wonder if awakening is like is that just the tool to make you a better person fully or is there like work you have to do in maturing and growing up as that self like do you think in a like a full-blown awakening and I, I guess i'm coming from a, an angle of a lot of people that have been enlightened masters haven't really acted in the most ethical ways and i like was truly convinced that these people are like enlightened then you read about some of the stuff they do and i'm like how could they do that to people if they are truly one with everybody how are they inflicting harm do you think there are uh like different aspects of growing up and waking up and that like are necessary to live a fully embodied like loving presence i don't know if that makes sense or not <laughs> yeah i think that's a very interesting question because it brings about the idea of a path is what i kind of hear with that and i actually want to go back to one of the things you said with the afterlife is is going back to like source and like unity consciousness and the interesting part about that is there's no division between this and that we are there yeah now here now there yeah. is no separation or after life it's only it's only life here now mm -hmm. for eternity so that's that's what i kind of meant with like the duality is unity like we are perceiving duality right now but this is unity no differently than a little you know in my head it always goes back to like a little ball of energy that's like how i perceive like you know clear it's like obvious unity as opposed to now is this it's the same unity but it's just the perception of division has gotten so strong and the perception of of separate identities has gotten so much we've taken it so much more seriously so much more literally that that we don't see that this here now is the same exact unity as a little you know blue ball of energy in in the center of existence so um but yeah with with the uh the learning and the journey, I think when it comes to all of those things, at least for me, like a big recognition has been almost like the importance of unlearning all the things I thought to be true, as opposed to, you know, reading a ton of books. I think reading books is, is absolutely awesome for a lot of people and, and can help them recognize things that they may not have before, but like, any other practice, it's not a requirement to recognize any of this. And I think something that can be even more important or, or more helpful is, is questioning everything you think to be true. It's not necessarily learning more on top of the reality of unity, the reality that I'm here now, but unlearning that you, all of the perceptions that you've had, thinking that you're anything besides what you always have been here and now. So I, for me, at least it comes back to just a constant questioning of things that I get hung up on thinking that I am and recognizing that I'm not, or thinking that 
things should be a certain way or shouldn't be a certain way or, or perceiving a situation to be a certain way. It's just the recognition that it's never how I think it is. It's, that's just my individual preference, my unique perspective of it. And so it just comes back to in every moment, the most beneficial thing to me has been just questioning all those things and recognizing that they're never the truth. And any ideas I have about myself that I perceive, you know, this, idea of myself to be is never what I actually am. And so that has been, if any, if I have a practice, it's that it's just questioning everything. I, I think I am to the point we talked about it last episode that you get to a point that you no longer assume initially. So as important as it is to question everything, you, you'll get to a point eventually where you no longer need to question everything because you're not assuming things to be the truth to begin with. So a big part for me has been on learning everything I, you know, thought to be the truth. Yeah. And I want to go back to this for a second, John, because this is a good question. You got me thinking now. Um, it, it's interesting because we go through this phase, like we're born and our body is pretty much useless. Um, we're, we're totally vulnerable and the world is very scary. And, and so we're taught how to identify, how to build an idea of ourselves versus everything else and, and how to survive in that game and, and to play that game well into our teenage years, comparing and competing and doing all that and living within the pecking order and whatnot. And then of course that brings about consequence and pain and suffering and all that other fun stuff. And so we, we get through that and we recognize, okay, maybe that strategy uh, holding on to that strategy as truth, identity, wasn't the best idea for me. And then we have a recognition of unity or recognition of what is, which is not our identity. So now we have this recognition of unity and we go out into the world. But just like when we started building our ego, we had to go through a whole bunch of experiences to try that ego out, right? To let it develop, to, to go through different situations back and forth and go, oh, I'm going to adapt it this way and adapt it this way. Well, we have to do the same thing with the lack of ego. Right. It's like that expression, like, uh, or, or the story of the guy who went up onto the mountaintop until he became enlightened years later, comes down fully aware, meets one person, has an argument, goes straight back up the mountain. Right. And it's because it's one thing to recognize unity. It's another thing to put it in motion. It's another thing to be looking at somebody and to recognize your triggers being reflected back to you because they're not following your script right? They're not following your ideas of what unity and enlightenment are or any of that, right? And so, yeah, there is this, this kind of process of, okay, I'm not what I think. I'm going to go out into the world. Oh, that person just smacked me. I feel really defensive. Oh, I'm thinking about myself again. And, and so it's, it, I got to do that. And then you come back and you recognize you don't need to defend yourself. The next time you interact with somebody who smacks you, you're a bit more empathetic. You know, you're, you're not trusting, but you're vulnerable or at least more than you were. Right. And so it becomes this process of, of realizing over and over and over again that the strategy that you're habitually reaching for that you built your whole life is, in fact, failing you just over and over and over again, because that's all that's happening. You've had the insight. You're like, that's not me. But then something comes along, threatens you, and you immediately reach for the thing that you've always used to, to protect your sense of value and certainty. Right. That's it. It's just habitual. It's always been there. Right. And so, yeah, once you hit that point of awakening, get out in the world, get people to frustrate you, get people to challenge you, because it's in that that you really see what you're still holding on to. You really see the identity that you still cling to for certainty and for protection. Right. And it gives you a chance to let it go if you decide to let it go. Or you can go, I know better than that unconscious person and you can ignore it and treat them badly and justify it because, you know, you're aware and everything is anyway. Yeah, so it's like a constant. It's like a constant clearing process, right? I mean, that's like it's like some people call it. Teachers call it post awakening. It's more of a clearing process through like understand because I I am hyper aware of my resistance patterns. So it's like trying to like not feed them whenever they do happen. It's like Ramdas said what he said when you know how to listen, everyone's your guru. That's yeah. like when nice you exactly. really like try to like when when you really do try to like live that truly like on a day to day experience. Um, every single moment of the day can be, I also feel like, cause this stuff is just in my head 24 seven. Like, it's not like I can just like put it off. Like there's like back in the day, I get interested in stuff and it would go away. Like this is literally always here within me. And I do wonder if I'm like over intellectualizing it. Cause I do read a lot of books. I do find it fascinating. I love reading spiritual. My biggest thing is I like reading spiritual biographies of like people that have really um, gotten high. That's like what I like the most. Uh, but I do wonder sometimes if I, 
I do wonder if it might honestly be better for me to step away, don't read books as much and just like go try to like live my normal life. Cause I've heard that that's like a way to get deeper into it. When you just like hyper obsess over it over and over again, sometimes it creates these uh, perceptions or filters that like you don't see cause you're in it. So, I mean, I, I mean, I guess, <laughs> I mean, I know it's here now, everything's always here now, but I, I do know that there's a lot more, um, obviously room for me to develop and grow into this stuff and open and surrender. So I'm always trying to look for what's the, what's like the best path to go or things like that. And, um, I mean, uh, like I, I mean, obviously there's so many different meditation traditions, right? Like Vipassana or like, uh, uh, Dzogchen, uh, Advaita Vedanta, like all these types of stuff. Right. Um, I'd be curious to know, uh, Ray, your experience or what your thoughts are and like what's path leads to an easier liberation um would you say like the Advaita Vedanta Dzogchen path or like the Vipassana like intense concentration meditation what are your thoughts on those I I'm always one for um just focus, attention just attention right just awareness and attention yeah. and and the thing with that is that it's a fluid being it's not a practice like you you can't sit down and go, I'm going to pay attention to my breath because your thoughts are going to pop up, in which case you're going to go, oh, okay, I'm going to pay attention to my breath and my thoughts, <laughs> right? But then you're like, no, hold on. There's the silence beneath my breath and my thoughts. I'm going to pay attention to that. And so it's more or less just the attention just keeps flowing from one thing to the other, to the other, to the other, until you realize there is no I that's paying attention, that you are in fact attention itself. You are reality. The, your focus is, is existence as, as a whole. And as soon as you're there, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can take a walk, you can read a book, you can watch TV, you can do whatever you want because you're no longer trying to get anywhere. You're free, yeah. right? So I stopped meditating years ago in terms of sitting down and making it a practice. I just don't do it anymore. And the reason was because it started becoming a crutch. It started becoming something that I felt I needed to do in order to maintain balance. And immediately that's me losing, losing strength, right? I can feel that. Because it's like, oh, I've just put a condition on my balance. I don't like that. And, and so I walked away from meditation to the point where I started recognizing that meditation is something you can do in each and every moment as it's happening. And it's so much more important to be able to do it when you're in rush hour traffic frustrated than it is to be able to do it cross-legged in your room by yourself, right? It's, it's under pressure that meditation really starts to matter. Um, and so that, that's what I, I focus on in general. And I do it all the time. Like if I notice myself thinking, I'll have a little laugh at it and like, Oh, I'm taking myself seriously again. And that's it. I'll just remove from the process and then allow it to continue happening while I enjoy my existence. But yeah, it, it, it is a process, but I would say if you're going to practice anything, it's whatever it is that resonates with you, not somebody else's practice. The more you can walk away from other gurus, in my opinion, or in my experience, the better you get at this stuff. Like I don't read books about this stuff anymore. And, and honestly, it's because that too becomes a crutch. Other people's words, other people's ways of expressing this, right? The fact that you think that they're other people, right? Like when I read a book now by say Krishnamurti or Alan Watts or anything like that, I'm reading myself. I'm reading me. Right. So that means I don't need to read it. Right. But it took me years of walking away from those books to really get that. I could tell you that I could say, oh, yeah, I know. I know we're all one consciousness, blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't until I was in those situations of frustration and I didn't have the Dhammapada to reach for or I didn't have the Tao Te Ching that I had to go. Right. What do I know? I know I'm here now. Right. What do I know is not everything I'm thinking. Okay. And, and it became the practice as opposed to the intellectual practice. It became the actual like tried and true in the moment. This is my existence practice as opposed to just an intellectual exercise. And, and that is the difference between sitting on a mountaintop teaching this as opposed to being in the world, embodying it. Because as you go out in the world and you test yourself and you do all that and you oscillate back and forth and you find your center over and over and over again, what's so important to recognize is that the world is helping you do that because it's you. So as you're refining your process, you're automatically going to encounter all the other things that are going to allow you to continue to do that. But what's interesting is that everybody who's a part of that, everybody who's a part of that is also in that process. Your refinement is refining the whole, right? 
but it can't so long as you're trying to refine the whole. It can't so long as you're trying to get anywhere. It can't so long as there's a division or a path or anything else. You have to be free. And then freedom spreads itself in your heart, in your soul, in your relationships, in the world around you, because freedom is its own reward, right? So if there is any practice meditation, it's just continue to recognize that you're already free. There's nowhere to go. So more Dzogchen than Vipassana. Largely, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't like go down the rabbit hole with this stuff, right? So I got like, you know, Daniel Ingram, he does like the hardcore uh, Buddhism book where he talks about the four stages, like stream enterer, once returner, no returner, arhat, that type of stuff. Um, that just seems very grueling to me. I do agree that just like using your day to day and just constantly opening, right? Constantly surrendering is an easier practice that, to actually sustain throughout the day, as opposed to trying to go through the jhanas or like do very deep concentration work. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just so open to all this stuff. I oscillate part of me wonders if, uh, me just reading what I like and then, um, like jumping from one thing to another, uh, hampers my ability to go deeper. Cause I'm not like focusing on one practice, but I mean, it's worked nope. well for me up to I this would point. Say no. So I don't know. Yeah. Beware, okay. beware the urge to, to structure, right? Like that, that's the one thing I would say is that it's so tempting to want to make a structure of this. It's this many stages to enlightenment, right? But I just that, want to know how many steps I have to right? know to get enlightened. <laughs> that path always ends up coming up to a wall. There's always a point yeah. where, where you just, you will stagnate and you'll be stuck on reason and intellect. And, and it's because you're already whole, right? Yeah. You're already whole. And so it's getting out of your way. It's then, and, and I can't express how much of it is that like, there's been so many times over the last 20 years of my life where I've been, in, I've been frustrated. I've been in conflict with work or with somebody in my life and trying to find a resolution to that led to more conflict and frustration and all that. And then finally I go, Oh, I'm thinking about myself. And it would just, it would just go away. And all of a sudden a solution would present itself. My intelligence would start to flow again and, and, and things would start to change, but it was always that stagnation at, I need to figure out a process. I need to be in control. Right. And, and Andrew and I talked about this, I believe in season one, but I had an insight early on that there is a very big difference between thought and insight. Thought is always effort. It's always the result of control. Insight is the result of surrender, the result of relaxation. So if you want an insight, relax, and it'll come to you. But when you're under pressure, it's very difficult to practice that. Like I had to learn Kung Fu, a style of Kung Fu that actually required me to relax while somebody was throwing chain punches in my face in order to start practicing that on a physical level. Right. Because it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm relaxed. And inside you're just churning away with all the processes. Right. Finally, when you realize, like, all I can do is be what I am right now. I was having this conversation with somebody last week about um, anxiety, like prepping yourself for a conversation that you're going to have in five minutes. Right. Thinking that somehow that five minutes of prep is going to make you a vastly different person than the entire lifetime that led you up to the conversation itself. You are already the person you're going to be having that conversation. Second guessing it going into it is only adding distortion to how you would otherwise act. Right. It's an interesting catch 22. It's almost like you're getting yourself in the way. And that's what I think of with a lot of the practices. And it's almost like just the simple recognition that there's nothing to get. There's nowhere to go. There's no, no right or wrong way to do any of this. There's no right or wrong thing to say. There's no correct answers is like the base layer of it. If you want, if we want to try and conceptualize it and then any practice, any learned method is like a layer one th thing or like a layer two, but the layer two can never be the base layer. It's never going to be it. So any practice, any teacher, any book, any video, any thing that you learn it's never going to be that thing. So, so the second layer isn't a requirement to get there. It can allow you to find a little bit more freedom, find a little bit more pre peace, but it's not going to, it's not it. It's not the recognition that there isn't anywhere to go because continuing 
to think that that's going to get you to where you need to be is what's keeping you from the recognition that there's nowhere to go. And it kind of goes back to like the paradoxes that it always is, but that's how I think of it sort of now. And so I will similar to Ray, like I, I stopped meditating like four or five months ago. I meditated for like three years, every single day. And it got to a point where it became this sort of crutch. And I felt like I needed it to get through the day. If I didn't meditate and then something came up later in the day, I was like, fuck, did I meditate today? Oh shit. I didn't. Oh fuck. Oh God damn it. And then it like, you know, brought up all these insecurities and like, oh gosh, like, am I going to be able to take this on? And it was never. And when I started to see things a little bit more clearly, I saw that meditation was just 10 or 15 minutes out of my day that I was sitting in silence, observing my thoughts, but it didn't have the lasting impact necessarily. I think it can allow you to recognize that, you know, there is that separation. You can observe your thoughts, but it's not like doing that in the morning is going to impact your reaction, you know, sitting in traffic and not getting worked up later in the day. Like you don't need those 10 minutes in order to do that. And your lack of reaction or acceptance for your situations later on in the day, that's like, that's the meditation. Like life is the meditation, your moment to moment experience of surrender, as we've talked about a few times that, that is, that is it, but there isn't a practice that guarantees that besides the doing of it in the moment, almost like that, that is the path. That is the experience that will free you is just like recognizing that nothing's going to free you outside of yourself. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't sit, I don't sit formally as much as I used to. I, I do think I do. I, I mean, every morning I go for a walk, I'll sit at a rock looking over the lake. Cause I find it beautiful. And to be honest, yeah. it's like throughout the day, I find myself meditating randomly. Like when I'm walking outside or when I'm, I can just stay like, I can just stare at the sky. I'll just stare at the sky for like five minutes randomly when I'm looking at it. Um, so it's kind of just like ingrained, but I do think it's, it is necessary for people initially just to be aware, right. Of their thoughts. Cause most people aren't even aware of that inner monologue, right. They don't realize that the resistance to the inner monologue is what creates these negative emotions within themselves. Um, so I do always think that like that I've never done any like serious meditation or treats though. Um, and I do wonder what that would be like if I, if I was to do something of, of that nature, not that it's necessary, but it just has like a cool experience type of thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. Like, but not cause I, that the one thing I love, like, so the, the waking up app that Sam Harris has, like those conversations that he has with all those people has been so like, it's crazy. Like, I got, I go through this stuff in this day and age and to a psychedelic treatment clinic. And then they have like resources like YouTube and like this waking up app that has like these spiritual masters that are all talking about their experiences. And it's like, this never existed in the history of the world. And now I just have all this ridiculous wisdom at my fingertips which i literally there are moments where i'm just like flabbergasted that i get to live in this period and kind of go through this and have these resources because back in the day you'd have to travel to india you have to follow somebody and you have to take the guru's full advice for it and who knows if this guy's like a sociopath or not but nowadays there's just so much available like there's so much stuff on youtube and the apps and just gives you a good understanding um, of every side of it right so you can kind of see where you fit in um it's just like I mean, I know this is this is a constant thing that everyone says in the spiritual world is like when somebody has an awakening, they think the world's going to be awakened, right? Like in the 70s, they're like, oh, the world's going to be awakened by 2000. I kind of, maybe this is just me in the same vein, but I'm like with technology and this information, and I do believe that this is like the way to live a better life. This is the highest quality of life you can live, right? Like focusing on these things. I do, um, I do wonder if it's going to lead to like, more of a awakening across the whole world, but that might just be optimistic. And I might be one of the many hippies in the seventies. I thought the world was going to be enlightened, but, uh, but who knows? <laughs> we actually, uh, we did a whole episode on that uh, a little while ago called the great awakening, uh, basically on, on the entire concept of the great awakening. And we have a shot, we have a chance. I mean, that's the thing is that people in the spiritual realm tend to think like, Oh, it's going to happen for us. The universe is just, if it's that time we're, we're going to, into our ascension. Whereas because we are what is, we are the universe. Um, it kind of goes both yeah. ways. As much as the opportunity is there and, 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 and the gateway might be there, we still have to walk through it. We still need to do the work in order to surrender the stuff that's making our life and our world so hellish. And, and so there, there is that we are the great awakening should we choose to take advantage.
of it. Um, but I wanted to go back quickly just to what we were talking about because you had mentioned Zen, and this is very much going back to what Andrew was saying about you know the path to no path, basically. Um, that what's funny about Zen is that as you start to understand more about Zen, like you get to one percent, two percent, three percent, four percent, and you keep keep going, then all of a sudden it goes straight back to zero, and and it's because <laughs> there's nothing to understand, and more and worse, there's nobody to understand it, right? And that's that's the whole thing that I love about Zen is what conversation? Where are we where are we going? What's happening, right? Like, there is no, there is no journey in Zen. What is is you are already here now. There's nowhere else to go. The entire creation of a journey is your problem, right? The entire idea that there is somewhere to go is the source of your conflict, and then that's why Zen is very hard for people to to really take in. Krishnamurti was very much hard for people to to take in too towards the end of his life because he became so razor's edge. It's either what is or it's not. Right. And everybody's like, well, is it going to be like this when I'm enlightened? You? Ah, let's just talk about this. Let's not like, like project enlightenment. Let's just talk about what's happening now. Right. And everybody just wanted him to go further to you know, like, tell me what the answers are. It's like, stop looking for them. That's what's stopping you from seeing them. That's what's stopping you from learning is that you're settling on conclusions that make you feel like, you know, instead of asking why you feel you need to know. Right. And then, then that's that thing is that that conversation can get so very razor's edge. And that's when you really start to see who's just trying to feel better as opposed to who is being free, because the people who are free have no fear of that conversation. Whereas people who are trying to feel better, they run from it pretty quick. I remember I gave a Krishnamurti book to a spiritual friend years ago, and she gave it back to us, I think, three days later. She's like, I can't stand him. He doesn't give me any answers at all. And she was pissed. And, and it was just like, that's the point, though. Like, why do you want those answers outside of just to be able to wrap everything up in a bow and continue to act the way that you've been acting? Right. Yeah, I mean, Krishnamurti is fascinating his life story and everything is like mind blowing when you actually learn about it and how he was like trying to be guru to be this world guru. And then he comes out and says, I'm no one's guru. Like it's like the most crazy story ever. I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all, I, I, I need to honestly, the, with the amount of time that Ray has brought up Krishna Murthy, I, I really need to get it. <laughs> listen to at least some of his stuff. I just, yeah, it's been interesting. Like the last, I actually haven't listened. Uh, I haven't listened to a lot of Krishna Murthy at all. He's, I, I don't know why I just haven't. I've listened to so many different people. It's, I feel like he's so serious. He's hard to listen. Like, to. I like better to read. I like leader. I like like leaders or masters or whatever that are like laughing the entire time. Like this is like a, it's like a like what you, we're talking about here is funny because this is a joke. Like it's like you don't you. You don't mm -hmm. see what's happening right now, right? So it's, I like people that are like, I'm just more, gra I, I'm like laughing more so that's more my like baseline. I, so that's why. I think the point for him was seriousness. And, and it was because, and he, and he goes at length about the need to take this seriously because people don't, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, yeah. and, and that combined with the fact that, again, like he was taken from India, he was raised in a very traditional um, form of schooling right? He was, he was taught to act and speak in a very certain way. And so that, that very much, yeah. you know, carried with him for the rest of his life, but you'll, you'll catch moments where he lets that down and he laughs and he has a good giggle about certain things and, and, and you'll see his humor in it, but yeah, no, the way he brings it across is very serious. And because he is so very calm and very collected when he's speaking, if you're, if you're used to absorbing information at a faster rate, it's difficult. Right. So I would highly yeah. suggest reading Krishnamurti at, at that point, because the fact that when you're reading anything uh, by Krishnamurti, you'll realize they're all transcripts, which is amazing. It, it's just mind yeah. blowing when you go through it and you go, really? Off the top of your head? Wow. And the crazy thing is, like, when they do, when they do speak like that, it's not like thoughts. Right. Like when you have like when I like was like in that mode, even to this day, I do technically have like these downloads, what do you want to call it? Revelations. And it's like. It's not like I'm thinking these things. It's just is it right? So it's like it's almost like a way out on everything because it's like I don't need to worry or like overthink something because it's like what come like there are times I talk about certain things like spiritual. I'm like I'm very new to it, right? So I don't know that much. I'll just I'll like surprise myself with the things that I say that I didn't even know was in there and it just kind of comes out. And I feel like that's a lot of like uh, the spiritual masters or leaders. It's like they're just talking. 
and like they they don't even know what they said a set they don't even know what they said a sentence ago they don't know what they said yesterday they're just talking in the moment and it just comes out like poetry and it's like this like amazing thing to behold i just find it fascinating <laughs> intelligence in motion right like that that's it yes. we get out of the yeah. way and suddenly the limitless intelligence of what is of the universe actually has the opportunity to act and we embody it it's just that we get in the way trying to be intelligent and we cut all of our potential down as a result and so this is why like uh, expressions like my words or my father's very much resonate with exactly what you were saying it's the more we get out of the way it's almost like the easier it is to just be ourselves, which is terribly funny if you, if you really break it down because it really tells you like the problem is my illusion of myself. My problem is my idea of myself. Until that gets in the way, I'm actually quite good at learning. I'm actually quite good at adapting. I'm good at resonating with people or empathizing or anything else. But as soon as there's something to protect, as soon as there's something that, that gives me value, I'm in conflict immediately. Yeah, it's it's that was like one of the most fascinating things for me was was getting my idea of myself out of the way and conversations and speaking. It's like it's the most freeing thing because I would always have this idea of myself as I was speaking. And it was like that would cause me to stumble on my words. And it was like a constant self-judgment and fear of perceptions of other people like as words are coming out of my mouth and I'm like thinking each word whereas now it's very much like you know we'll we'll get done with an episode and we'll be like I don't know what the fuck we just talked about but it was pretty good I think so yeah it'll be fun to listen back to and it happens like more and more and I get it a lot on podcasts especially because like when I'm a guest on an, at a different podcast, a lot of times I'm so used to like going deep on dualistic unity that it's like, I like the lighter questions and, and not like easier questions, but I don't know, like a little bit more surface level. And it's just like, I don't know what I'm going to say, but like stuff starts coming out and then all of a sudden I don't even remember like where it started. And I'm like, I just stopped talking. I'm like, did that come close to what you're asking and it's like i don't even care because it doesn't matter because the the point isn't the answer to be correct and i used to get so hung up on that like oh am i gonna say yeah. the best thing like what is what is even the best thing andrew like what the you know you don't know how someone is going to perceive an answer you don't know what's going to be helpful to certain people and like does it even matter or is it more important to be the embodiment of that which you are talking about in the moment where it doesn't matter and you are just expressing that sort of universal intelligence here and now. And so the words become less important, but as they become less important to you, to this idea of you, the clearer they get to the, the rest of the universe experiencing itself. And it's like just another fucking paradox. And it's so crazy that it's like, the more you get yourself out of the way, the clearer you get, but you can't be through the perception of self for the self. It, it, it's, it has to be for, for nothing and no one basically. Yeah. Otherwise you're immediately split in half. I love that paradox. The fact that the more interested I am in what I'm talking about, the more interested I am through everybody else that I'm talking to in what I'm talking about. But as soon as I'm split, as soon as I'm talking about it, doubting what I'm talking about, wondering how they're going to receive it or how, what they're going to think about it, conversation just falls apart. There's no interest there from me. So of course there's no interest there from me on the other hand. Right. And I just love the symbolism there. It's like, be present, be whole, and you will experience wholeness in action. That's the whole point, but it's, it's unfolding it unfolds in front of you as you embody it, right? Everybody wants to get to this, this cognitive or this conceptual understanding of unity or enlightenment or freedom. Freedom isn't a concept, right? Being is not an idea. There's no understanding to come to. There is just a state of being that you will become used to or that you will learn how to, how to feel with more sensitivity that you will learn to embody without doubting, without fearing. But when you're in that state, you're, you're immediately going to go like, oh shit, am I doing the right thing? And then you'll fall out of it and then you'll come back into it. But it's that process of, of just, again, oscillating back and forth, right? And it becomes self-refining. It's almost like reality, us, wants this to happen. 
right? And like I, I, I ran across an expression that life helps life. And, and I thought that was a really good expression because it's true. The more we free ourselves, it's almost like we encounter more opportunities to embody freedom where other people can learn from it or have the opportunity should they have the state of mind. I remember um, our social anxiety and worry workshop that Andrew and I did. I think it was the second day Andrew was coming back on, on the airplane and he was getting into the taxi as we were starting the workshop. And of course, right there, a lot of people would have been like, oh my God, I'm late. I got to rush. I got to do all this. There could have been all this anxiety. And instead, we just kind of chatted back and forth and continued the, the workshop regardless on Zoom and all that. And we worked it into the lesson of, of the episode. Later on, somebody contacted me after, after watching that. And they, they said that that was the most informative part of the workshop because it was actually seeing us in motion deal with a moment where we could have dealt with it in anxiety. We could have freaked out about it not going exactly the way that we wanted to or how people might perceive it. Oh God, is it unprofessional? He's in a cab. And we just rolled with it. We expressed what we were going through. We expressed the lessons that were open to us at the time. And we didn't even plan that. And it ended up being by far one of the best parts of that workshop. No, yeah. I mean, it's uh, kind of to your point about like talking about this stuff and not like needing to know all the answers. I mean, for me, it's so easy to talk about because it's just me trying to talk through my experience. And I'm not even trying to be right, to be honest. I just, I mean, it's an obsession with the truth, right? That like I'm on, that you guys are on. It's an obsession with the truth. Like that one question, like what is the source of happiness? Like I am okay with being completely wrong. If you can show me a new way, that'll like get me deeper into this stuff. Like I truly will. Like I'll scrap everything I said I'll, and I'll say that it was wrong. And that's what just makes these conversations so much more fun. Um, like I used to be somewhat like pay attention to politics. Now I, it's, it's really tough for me to pay attention because I just hate, it's the, like the worst of the egos that creates these division, right? So, and like back then you talk politics, you always had to intellectualize everything. Like whatever your point of view is, you have to have studies and stats and why they're wrong and all this stuff. And it was, talk about this stuff is just like free flowing and it's it's just exciting right because everyone on the journey of trying to understand themselves and the truth and um if you can step away from yourself it just makes life so much easier so that's why i love these type of conversations i mean there have been moments in this conversation where i've been like shit like this is like i'm feeling a certain way because it's true when you're like because you get like wrapped up and we talk about i don't talk about this stuff that much i don't have that many people um, close to my life that I talk to this. So when I do have these conversations, it's like there are these moments of like clarity where you're like, wow, how I, how have I been overlooking that or overlooking this or um, things of that nature? So uh, this, is, this has been great. Yeah, likewise. I, I, I love these conversations. Andrew and I have been doing this since September. Um, we've been working more this season towards involving more people like yourself in this conversation because there is a, a theme in terms of this journey that at first you end up being isolated. You're on your own in this and that's necessary to the journey because you can't accept unity if you're not being alone for a little while. You have to be one by yourself in order to accept that you're one with everything else, right? So it does help to have that period of isolation. But then afterwards, there used to be people in the village that we could go and talk to about this. You know, there used to be people who, who by their very you know, station in life, had this knowledge, they're not around anymore. I mean, everything's become an exercise in ego or an exercise in, in being a credit. I mean, you have to go to university to get certain degrees to become a priest, to prove that you know about God through books, right? Like it's the funniest thing at the end of the day, but this, this journey is happening more and more all the time because as, as you said earlier, there is so much information. There's so much information, like you can pick a path and follow it. And as long as you're not ever settling on an answer, that path will continue to lead you back to yourself, right? And that's the whole point. Um, and, and so I just wanted to say that, John, having you here was, was a huge thing because I, I really wanted to get you involved with this conversation. Your content resonates a lot with where I was on the journey. I know it resonates a lot with people, uh, people who listen to this show who have expressed their own journeys. And so I just wanted to mention that that is what we're doing here. We are having this conversation for the sake of growing this audience, of growing this discussion of, of causing ripples because you're already out there making ripples. We've been doing the same and our ripples just collided. And now we've made an even bigger ripple. We don't need to know where it, where it goes or what it's gonna do. The fact is that it's happening. 
which is why we enjoy this conversation. So I do hope that you will come back and join us again, John, for another episode. Uh, we do roundtables as well. It would be great to have you on with another guest just to keep this conversation going. We also have a Discord channel with uh, 260 members, I, I think at this point, all of which are interested in this conversation. I'm so excited to, to be able to share this interview and of course your content with them. Yeah. Why, yeah, why, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, just to echo Ray, you know, we're we're fairly picky with with guests on this podcast, and and so we really appreciate you coming on. I absolutely love your content, and you're you're on the ball so much with you know everything that you talk about. So it's it's been an honor having you on, and and the conversation exceeded the lack of expectations that I had, but it would have exceeded any of the ones that I would have had if I had any. <laughs> Awesome. Um, well, thank you guys so much. Honestly, this is this has been an honor to have you on and Ray reached out to me. It's like one of these things that like I do my own thing. I just watch you guys. And then it is weird the way that like everything gets brought together in this world. Right. So I really appreciate you. You having me on. This has been awesome. I could I could talk for hours. Um, but I guess, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll join the discord. And I'll, I'll start like uh, poking around, see what that's about. I haven't really dived into that yet. Uh, but I guess to anyone still listening, if anyone does struggle with addiction and they do want to reach out to me, um, my Instagram, my Instagram is attached to my TikTok at John Copeland six. You can DM me and I'll share my experience and I will share with you the clinic that I went to. Um, so I want you to know that you're not alone, that a lot of people go through this and that there is a way out. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that as a PSA at the end here, but uh, thank you guys so much for having me on and I'd be honored to do this again. Um, this was, this was a treat. Likewise, for us as well. Absolutely. And Andrew is absolutely correct. We're, we're, uh, we're very choosy about who we invite onto the show. And it's simply because, again, there are a lot of people who know the words, not necessarily the insight. And, and it's something that you can talk about without ever getting. But once you do get it, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. It comes through. And so with your videos, especially, it just comes through. And, and so we're grateful to have you here. This has been episode 15, of course. Um, and everybody who's listening, we do have another Patreon group chat coming up this Wednesday. Uh, there is also a free public group chat coming up on the first Wednesday of May. So you can register for that at our website. And of course, you can contact John uh, at his TikTok account, John Copeland6. John, thank you again so much for being here. Uh, Andrew, anything to wrap up with? We covered about everything. I, I'm looking forward to the you know next Patreon chat we got on Wednesday. Always love those. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as we enjoyed having it. We'll see you next week. <laughs>